Well, welcome everybody to Optometric Education Consultants National Webinar Series, uh, Tuesday evening edition. Our topic tonight is OCT and OCT angiography in retinal disease. And speaking is Dr. Greg Caldwell, who's a graduate of the Pennsylvania College of Optometry, where he also completed a one-year residency in primary care and ocular disease at PCO's Eye Institute. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry, a diplomat of the American Board of Optometry, and a member of the Optometric Glaucoma Society, and a member of the Optometric Wellness and Nutrition Society. He currently work in, works in Duncansville, Pennsylvania as an ocular disease consultant. His primary focus is diagnosis and management of anterior and posterior segment ocular disease, and has been a participant in multiple FDA clinical trials. He has integrated nutrition, prevention, and wellness into his patient care. Thus, he does practice true integrative optometry. He is a co-founder of Optometric, Optometric Education Consultants and co-administrator of OCT Connect on Facebook. He has lectured extensively throughout the country and over 13 countries uh, internationally, internationally. In 2010, he served as president of the Pennsylvania Optometric Association and served on the AOA Board of Trustees from 2013 through 16 and is president of the Blair Clearfield Association for the Blind. So with that, I think we're going to have a, a nice educational event this evening. So please give a virtual welcome to Dr. Greg Caldwell. Thank you, Joe. And thanks for that nice introduction here. And uh, just as we start every uh, COPE lecture or, or approved lecture, we go through disclosures here. And then really the first bu bullet point here is the content of this activity was prepared independently by me. You can see here, I have a bunch of uh, companies listed. I don't really do that to show off, but if I'm gonna try and be ahead of the curve here, um, attending these meetings and being a key opinion leader, they call them KOLs, it's just to try and deliver um, you know, the, the current information that's out there. I have no direct uh, financial proprietary interest in any of the companies or products or services mentioned in this presentation. I'm gonna be showing a lot of OptiView images tonight. Um, and I'll show you at times when there's things that are uh, proprietary to uh, OptiView, but really I try and teach all of these concepts so that they can be applied to really whatever OCT you've, you know, you've picked for your practice. I do sit as the uh, uh, PA medical director for Involve, it's managed Medicaid, uh, and jumping down to the, the second to last bullet point, the content and format of this course is presented without any commercial bias. I'm not claiming any superiority uh, over any instruments, um, not claiming any uh, commercial products or superiority. And as Joe mentioned, uh, half owner of Optometric uh, Education Consultants, uh, Joe is the other half, and it's been a great uh, five to six years uh, doing this uh, for uh, working with Joe and, and working uh, with the uh, attendees. A lot of people like to have resources, so I just get this out of the way here real quick. Joe mentioned co-founder of uh, OCT Connect. I think we got about 9,000 people here. Um, I have no financial interest. I'm not really making any money off of ads or doing anything on there, but it's really cool. We have people from uh, uh, Northern Hemisphere, Southern Hemisphere, Australia, posting uh, questions in there. Julie and I put this together for OCT and geography, but it's been really for B scan, as you'll hear me reference, and, a, and the angiography. Uh, as it's out there. So just go, if, you're, if you belong to Facebook, just look for OCT Connect. Julie and I will uh, uh, put you in there and it's great, great uh, content in there. Uh, you can just skim through and learn a lot just by looking at the images and comments. If you're looking for a book, um, you're gonna see me reference these type of images as B scan images, because we have angiography images. Um, anytime you see Duker or Wahid or Goldman, they're kind of the, uh, the inventors of kind of this technology back in the day. Um, so that's a great book for the B scan. And Julie Rodman wrote a book on uh, OCT and geography. It's a clinical case um, referenced uh, well and uh, great cases that are in there. So how does OCT work? Well, you got this REM first mirror. You got this low coherent light source. You got, I guys, I really don't know how the darn thing works. That's really a joke. Um, it's really this, uh, this uh, cartoon here. Uh, is probably the best uh, that a miracle occurs. And the professor is saying, 
Uh, I think you should be more explicit here in step two. I really don't know how coherent light and so on and so forth, but I can tell you as we go through here tonight, I'll talk to you about hyperfluorescent and hypofluorescent. Uh, you know, I've really learned how to interpret these images over the years uh, and try to bring some clinical pearls so that you can interpret these uh, in your office. The first polling question is, and Joe, if you can, if you can launch that, um, in my office, you know, you have an OCT, you have OCT angiography, both OCT and OCT angiography, or no OCT instrument at this time. And Brad, I see you replying via the chat box as uh, just OCT. It's okay if people want to put answers in the chat box, I'll keep an eye on. It looks like Joe has put both handouts there. So one is the full slides, and the other one is six slides per page. And look at that. Everyone's paying great attention answering that polling question. So if you want to wrap that one up, Joe, I can see uh, that most people have 50% have an OCT. That number's slowly creeping up with OCT and geography, 23%. And we have about a quarter of the audience that's uh, OCT free at this time. Now, a lot of people ask me, you know, which, you know, which one should I get? And I think I'm going to try and I'm not going to touch too much on uh, AMD tonight. But as lecturers, we always say the crime must fit the punishment. And, you know, we think of diabetes as a capillary disease. We'll review that tonight when we get to that part about two thirds of the way through. Macular degeneration has a choroidal neovascular membrane. We always say the crime must fit the punishment. If you got an infection, you got to use an antibiotic. If you got an inflammation, you use an anti-inflammatory. Well, if you got a capillary disease, using a B scan OCT is probably not going to get you the early detection, right? Joe mentioned about you know I'm doing some integrative work and true prevention and wellness, like colonoscopies are not prevention, maybe prevention to death, but it's really not preventing the, the colon cancer. It's early detection. So when we're using angiography, we're just getting earlier detection that's out there. So they're both important. So it depends on what I'm looking for in the, uh, uh, in the patient. If I'm doing which we'll get to at the end here, Plaquenil, the very last thing I'll wrap up with will be Plaquenil toxicity and how to look for it. And um, you want to use a B scan for that. But if you're looking for diabetic retinopathy, well, you probably really want to be using an angiography for that. And I'll show you some case examples. Going back in history, time domain, um, that was our stratus. That was about 15 to 16 microns of resolution. So I think we're all pretty familiar with the metric unit, but you know, we're all familiar with PDs and millimeters. If you take a millimeter and you cut it a thousand times, that's a micron. So that was about 15 to 16 microns of resolution. Jumping into spectral domain, which is probably what most everyone of that 50% has out there and that 27% for sure uh, within that, uh, or 23% of that OCT and OCT angiography, you're getting down to five to six microns of resolution. So what I usually say to the patient is just imagine taking a slice of bologna, it's about a millimeter thin or thick, whichever way you wanna look at it, and cutting that, saying to the delicatessen person, hey, can you slice that a thousand more times for me? And five or six microns is what you're able to see uh, with the resolution. And it's kind of neat uh, when you're talking about within the pharmacology range, we a lecture over there and you're hearing about submicron technology, some of the drops, the molecule is about five or six microns in size. So you'd be able to see even the, maybe the, the drop size, but there's nanotechnology out there, but just kind of showing you what we can see uh, with these instruments. And that's why you've seen with this 15 to 16 micron worth of resolution back in 2002, time domain and a nice crisp, cleaner, sharper image in 2006, with spectral domain. Now, going back, you know, I'm starting to forget the exact amount of scans in that time domain, but let's just say it was about, you know, 10 to 15,000 scans per second. To bump up to clearer images, what you're doing is you're getting to about 30 to 35,000 scans per second. 
And then jumping up into uh, the OCTA, which was 2014, here's the kicker why your spectral domain that does 30,000 scans per second, you need to have it scanning at 70,000 scans per second. And when things are scanning one 1,000 and you're getting 70,000 scans per second, what's what you're able to do with the algorithms is what's moving and not moving. The retinal tissue should not be moving, but the the capil the 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 blood in the capillaries can be picked up, subtracted out, and you can see what's happening. Uh, and so, if you did a three second scan and had 210,000 scans per second, now you can start getting capillary images that are out there. So it's all about the scan speed when it comes to that. And this is the reason why I, I give out my, my handouts because, you know, we just label some things and you guys just remember this is the vitreous. I'm really big about the inner and outer retina when it comes to macular degeneration. The inner retina is really where the blood supply is. The outer retina is mainly the photoreceptors. And then when we get down to the RPE level, uh, it hyperfluoresces and then we're able to see uh, uh, choroid and sclera. So I kind of think of it as maybe vitreous neurosensory retina with an inner and outer RPE and choroid. And again, I just put this in here for your, uh, for your reference, and that's why I send the slides. Hyperfluorescent right here is your retinal nerve fiber layer, but it's thicker over here than on this side. So we know the optic nerve is sitting over here. We really don't have to have a reference point uh, that's out there. Uh, and we're going to talk about this line right here. It has changed its name numerous times over the year, the inner and outer segments um, of the photoreceptors, the photoreceptor integrity line known as the pill, the ellipsoid zone. So I was kind of looking into, you know, why is it changing its name and what's the significance about it? And what I want this to be, you know, someday maybe someone will call it the Caldwell line because I keep hammering to the audience what this really is. Why does it hyperfluoresce? Is because it's the mitochondria of the photoreceptors. Mm -hmm. Right above it, it's the myoid zone. The myoid zone has uh, the, the mm -hmm. endoplasmic reticulum, smooth and rough, if you remember what's inside a cell. And it also has the Golgi apparatus. The mitochondria are so tightly packed here. And that's important when you're examining someone with macular degeneration or any type of retinal disease, and you're starting to see that true oxidative stress. And Joe mentioned, you know, in that wellness and prevention, it's all in vitality and anti-aging. It's always about the mitochondria. And I don't think I have it in this, in this slide deck, uh, and I need to add it or I can share it to everyone, anyone that wants it, but I was on OCT Connect someone posted that, you know, you can see the RPE complex here. And then at the base of the RPE, you can, that's where the mitochondria hang out. And there's actually more mitochondria in the RPE than there is, than there are in the photoreceptors. It's like something like 400 per photoreceptor and down here about 600 or maybe 700 so the mitochondria are super important. If you think about that disease, macular degeneration, we're trying to keep those mitochondria healthy. And again, this is just another labeling, just giving it to you. Again, you can tell the optic nerve is over here. This would be the nasal side. And uh, just here for reference in case uh, the audience would like to have it from the handout. Greg, uh, there, here's a little bit of uh, background information. I, I know you and I have never even spoken about this. So this may be, may be new to you. But several years ago, when the American Optometric Association had still had their own journal, the Journal of the American Optometric Association, there was a paper that was presented in there. And there was a case series of, of patients who had unexplained vision loss. And the person who actually did this had noted that there is disruption of this inner segment outer segment uh, uh, line in every patient and this is really when OCT was pretty new I think they were using using time domain and the person who uh, who published that who, who, who noticed this was an optometrist he may have been the first to twig off on this and there was Dr. Jerry Sherman out of New York yeah yeah, Jerry, uh, I've lectured and shared the st stage with Jerry. D Jerry's definitely a, 
very knowledgeable in this arena and um, no surprise to me that he was able to find that. So, yeah. And I, th I thought it was very interesting. And I was the editor or the reviewer for his paper. And I said, this is very interesting, wow. but he's all over the place. I mean, he's got to pick, pick some sort of name. He's calling it all kinds of things. And I think I may have suggested PIL. <laughs> there you go. All right, let's see if I can advance this slide or is my mouse not going to work? All right, we'll go this way. So we just kind of showed you some B scan. You'll see me reference this as a B scan OCT. Uh, what we're looking at here is the angiography. And look at this here. This is important. When you get to the superficial or capillary or deep capillary plexus, we're talking about the inner retina. This is where diabetes affects there's a loose association between the inner and outer retina, and that's why you'll see exudate and fluid build up in this kind of loose association area. So I kind of think as the photoreceptor area, I learned this when I went to SECO, and um, those that live by salt water and where rivers flow in will know this term, brackish water. I'm from Pennsylvania. I don't have any, I love going to the beach, but you know, I learned about going to the, the Atlanta Aquarium, brackish water, Whereas the mix of salt and, and, and non-salted water or fresh water, and it's brackish water. And I kind of think of the photoreceptor areas. You can see it's black. You got blood from above. You got the choriocapillaris down below. It has to get nourished uh, from that, from below and above. So you can see the, the superficial deep plexus. Then you have basically the outer retina, which is avascular to keep those photoreceptors seeing the images and then going down to the uh, choriocapillaris, which we know is a bloodbath. You know, here's a 25-year-old man. We're looking at uh, a couple different things here. Um, I look at these all day long. I use this uh, sometimes in glaucoma. So angiography, let me tell you, it's number one, it kicks butt in diabetes. Number two is macular degeneration, picking up these early coronavascular vascular membranes. It's great there. It's good for glaucoma. It gives me another data point. It's a biomarker, another measurement to help me with, with these patients. And you can see down here, we're getting another nerve fiber, nerve fiber layer, but a percentage right here of the retinal uh, peri, uh, peri, uh, papillary capillaries uh, in this area. You can see that it's a percentage of the tissue. And you'll start to see some really cool dropouts if I have it tonight when it becomes uh, for diabetes. Jumping over here to the macula area, you know, it's always thicker on that nasal side and a little thinner on the temporal side. But we can really see like in branch vein occlusions, artery occlusions, even in glaucoma, the capillary bed dropping out uh, on these. So this is a 25-year-old man that he was actually an extern of mine and, you know, really healthy you know, vibrant guy, tw 25 years old. And then this is, was my partner, you know, a few years ago, he's, he's in the practice, uh, very healthy uh, uh, doc. You can see here, he's got some vitreo macular adhesions, which we're going to talk about, but you can see that his macula aging does not really affect uh, this capillary density that's out there. It's disease that affects uh, the, the capillary density. So that's why it's good to know What's going on at the capillary level? What's going on at the tissue level? Plaquenil is a tissue disease. Capillary, uh, diabetes is a capillary disease. So if we're really going to do early detection for our patients, again, you'll hear me say that the crime must fit the punishment. This is nothing more than showing off what the instruments can do. This is nothing more than a radio peri papillary capillary image, a macular image. You can see the uh, the software has sewn this together and they call it a montage Im image that's out there. So I like showing off here the, the, and just, this is back to just another B scan. You know, we can see the RPE complex and then you can kind of come across here. I should put this in a polling question, but um, you know, when we see this, this mitochondria line, the Caldwell line here, the mitochondria line, this uh, ellipsoid zone here, um, you could see this little elevation. And back in the day when we had time domain and the stratus, we'd see it every so often on a really, really good scan, crisp, clean scan at 15 to 16 microns, but we see it all the time. So just ask yourself, is this macular edema? You can ask yourself, you know, what's going on here? Is it swollen? This is in the macula. 
This is not macular edema. This is, if you think about the, the morphology of the two types of photoreceptors, cones are tall and skinny, and uh, rods are like Caldwell, short and fat. So what you're looking at out here is a mix of rod and cones. But remember, in the foveola, right where this is, this foveola, it's cones. So you're seeing this tall, compact area of the cones giving you that elevation, basically knowing the anatomy. Dr. Lombardi at PCO was always right. You know, she's to this day, she said anatomy, anatomy, anatomy. So understanding the anatomy, understanding why you get this hump. Now, looking at this mitochondria line, that's how you can predict the acuities. And I'll kind of show that as we go through uh, the course here. You'll see that this inner retina can really take on a lot of stretching and distortion. But the outer retina, when it starts to become atrophied and, and diseased and stretched and damaged, that's your photoreceptor. That's when you'll start to see that these visual acuities start to drop. So I have 30 hours of OCT lectures. You know, we're doing two hours tonight on retina. It's been one of the polling, you know, one of the uh, one of the requests that people put in there, OCT, retina. And so we put this on the, the docket for tonight. So, you know, where to start? And I think I just kind of lined it up as where I see things a lot in clinic, right? And where I get texts, I got three texts today. Hey, Greg, can you take a look at this OCT? Sure, I'll take a look at it for you. Give it a little comment and maybe ask a few questions. But vitreoretinal interface disorders are where we, you know, I see a lot of, um, a lot of pickup and disease that's out there and kind of, the, the, the terminology, since I went to school and we really didn't have OCT back in the day when I went to school, we just kind of had different names based on photographs and what we saw on the retina. And then when OCT came out and then just recently, like 2014, the vernacular kind of changed in this arena. So I'll just kind of, in case you're getting letters from the retinologist, try to help clean it up. Talk about an epiretinal membrane, this vitreoid macular adhesion. We all have one at birth. It's 100%. But when we start to see it as we age, we're starting to see that vitreoid macular adhesion. If you start to get distortion to your retina, we call that vitreoid macular traction. And then there's definitions on pseudo holes, lamellar holes, and full thickness macular holes. And we'll cover that tonight. So I like asking when I do a live presentation, you, know, you can obviously see this epiretinal membrane going across the surface. You can kind of see how it's still attaching itself to the internal limiting membrane. There's fluid in here, most, most likely aqueous, probably aqueous fluid here. This is a cyst, but you can see this taunt epiretinal membrane. And you can see all the different names that are listed above there in bullet point number one. But I like asking the audience, where does that epiretinal membrane come from? Like, how does it end up there? It's an extra piece. So just kind of ask yourself, where do you think that, you know, where, where does it come from? Well, the answer is it's usually a break from a PVD to the uh, internal limiting membrane. And if you remember, there's a lot of other support cells in this, neur in this neurosensory retina astrocytes and glia cells. And what happened are when you get this crack in the internal limiting membrane, these cells can leak out and then they proliferate over time and then they actually mature. So if a retinologist is gonna peel this, they, they like for it to be a little bit more mature of a membrane rather than kind of slimy as a membrane. Usually at this point, you're getting this traction, this membrane's uh, mature, a little bit easier to peel at the time of that vitrectomy. Uh, so it basically comes from the neurosensory retina, a crack to the internal limiting membrane, and then the cells grow across. And once they're out, they're not trapped in that space, they can proliferate and, and grow. So here's another epiretinal membrane. And you can see that it has grown across the surface. It's kind of popped out that foveal pit you can see some cysts, but you know, ask yourself, look at how swollen, if you wanna say, or how much traction is on this in this epiretinal membrane. What would you expect the uh, acuity to be uh, on this, on this uh, 
on this retina for this patient. And if you look, and if you get down here to where the photoreceptors are, you can see the external limiting membrane. The myoid zone is the dark zone, the ellipsoid zone or the mitochondria. And then you see the RPE. This patient, I would say, is 2020 minus 2025 at worst. But because we're, measuring, we're using snellin acuity. Well, if I had this patient in my practice and I walked them out to the optical and did a pair of glasses, I would say to my optician, hey, look, this patient has a pretty good epiretinal membrane in their right eye. They read 2020 out of both eyes, but if I did contrast sensitivity, their acuity would, would be different. So if a patient comes in and they're like saying, hey, it's just not as crisp in my right eye or left eye, it's because of this epiretinal membrane, despite them reading 2020 uh, with Snell and Acuity. And you can see here, this is called OnFOS, E-N face, OnFOS, spelled E-N face, F-A-C-E, but pronounced OnFOS. You can see how this membrane right here is, is, is maturing. You can see the foveal pit. This is why it's been popped out. And you can just see the striations that have occurred. And where did this epiretinal membrane come from? From astrocytes, glia cells, and cells that are trapped in the retina. Somewhere there's probably a PVD. And this is just another representation here. You can see this is a photograph right here. You can see the PVD. That's what's showing up black here. It's created a crack. And you can see how it has grown across the surface here and has created uh, this puckering uh, uh, to this, to this macula. And then when you come to the B scan and you take a look, the foveal pit is still intact. And you can see from the different scans, these two here that I have image that, you know, the acuity should be pretty good. So has the PVD occurred or not? Well, in this case, it has occurred in this one right here. And in most, in the most cases of a um, an inter or an epiretinal membrane, you have to have some break. The number one cause would be a PVD. Um, if you did a laser procedure on the patient and you crack the internally limiting membrane, that would be another way to let those cells uh, out of there. But you have to get the cells out of the retina to proliferate across the uh, this surface. You know, Greg, the for, a, for a very long time, people would refer to these as idiopathic. And really, they're not idiopathic because there's a high propensity, as you said, for this uh, this disturbance from the PVD. So we probably should not be using the term idiopathic that often. I think that's pretty rare. You know, there there are numerous causes, but this used the, you ever used to say this is an idiopathic situation, and the uh, the dynamics of the PVD, I think, are, are really well explaining it. Yeah, and thanks, Joe. And look right here, as you're mentioning that on this scan, you can see an epiretinal membrane, but look what's hanging out right here. There's a PVD. So uh, yeah, it's a crack to the internal limiting membrane, letting those out. What's the big brother to this? The big brother to this is PVR, proliferative vitreoretinopathy. That's what happens usually after a retinal detachment where you get a horseshoe tear and you get RPE cells and retina cells. And that's really, you know, the, 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 I guess the bane is if that's the right word of a, of a, of a retinal detachment surgery, when you get that retina flat, you got it on the buckle and, you know, three to six weeks later, the patient comes in and you see that star fold where PVR proliferative vitreo retinopathy has grabbed because it's RPE cells and so on and so forth that have created that scar tissue. So it's like an epiretinal membrane on steroids. That's what proliferative vitreoretinopathy is. Now, I told you about the nomenclature and this is a great paper. Um, I should have made it as part of the handout. Anyone that wants it, please just email me. I have this saved. This is actually a pretty good read. Um, and this is like when I grew up, you know, it was epiretinal membranes and then all of a sudden lamellar holes and full thickness macular holes and stage 1A and 1B kind of disappeared. And, and uh, then I started seeing vitreomacular adhesion and vitreomacular traction. And it really came from this, the International Vitreomacular Traction Study Group. And look, you can see who led it. 
Remember, I told you, anytime you see Duker, that's a that's a pretty good name to take a look at it. Um, but this is the paper in 2000 and I believe 13. Yeah, right there, 2013. That really kind of changed the vernacular of um, of what we see out there when we see these letters coming in from the retinologist. And you know, the results I kind of have highlighted here, vitreomacular macular adhesion is defined as a periphobial vitreous separation. Basically, no distortion or you know, morphological changes to the fovea. That's whatever I was showing you back at my uh, uh, that 60 year old, my partner in the practice. That was the VMA, a vitreomacular adhesion. And that's because there was really no distortion to the retina. Once you start getting distortion to the to that kind of that foveal area, that's when it becomes a vitreomacular traction. And then based on whether it's 1500 microns or, or longer, it's either focal or broad. And then kind of that stage one, two, three, four was replaced by full thickness macular hole. And then how wide uh, that area is between the two parts of the retina, which we'll discuss. So, you know, VMA versus VMT, focal or broad, you can say that a VMA, this is right from the paper, VMA is focal or broad. Really, there's not really any much significance to that. But when you have a VMT, focals are the one that are more, more likely to end up maybe creating vision loss or turning into a full thickness macular hole. So a v vitreomacular adhesion, you know, I started seeing those in, in, the, in the letters from the retinologist, and it's equivalent to what we would call a stage one PVD. If you think about it, when we're born, our vitreous lines from the aura serrata, that whole area, and VMA, this partial like vitreomacular adhesion or this partial detachment is basically came about because we have OCT. So we're born with 100% of a VMA, but as we age, it starts to lift up. As long as there's no distortion to the retina, that's how it gets its name, vitreomacular adhesion. Once you start getting changes to the retina, as I have highlighted here, the macula, the thickening of the macula, va um, a vascular leakage, uh, macula schesis, uh, cystoid macular edema. Now you have a VMT, a vitreomacular traction. And it remains unclear whether or not there's any prognostic difference in focal or broad VMA. And you know, this paper was in 2013. You know, my end of patients like. If it's broad, it's, if it's focal, as long as I'm not seeing any traction, I'm really not seeing anything kind of happening with those VMAs. It's the VMTs, those vitreomacular tractions that we want to follow a little bit uh, closer. So with that being said, Joe, if we want to launch yep. polling question number two, you know, just take a look at this. Um, which eye has better visual prognosis? Uh, you know, is it A? Is it B? Um, you can put your you know, answers in the chat box. I'll keep a, a, an eye out on that. Um, are, are we live with the poll? No, Greg, it's uh, not allowing me to launch it. Bill to launch right. polling error. Here we go. I got it. Okay, got it. Sorry about that. Yep, no worries. Takes a village, takes teamwork. Zoom went boom on me. So if you look at these, these are both focal vitreomacular tractions. When you look at an OCT scan, most of the time what you're looking at is about a disc diameter. Remember a disc diameter is about 1500 microns. So what we're looking at in, in a typical scan, this is a little bit wider scan, but usually from about here to about here is 1500 microns. So this is well short. So this is a focal vitreomacular traction. This is a focal vitreomacular traction. So I'll end the poll here. I'll share the results. And what's my question here? Which eye has better visual prognosis? We have A winning and I would agree. And if you look at that outer retina, you can see this lamellar separation 
It's not fully broken. So this would be a macula schesis if you want to kind of hear the terminology. But you can see that the mitochondria, the external limiting membrane, the outer retina uh, is intact. But when you come down, even though this is a, if you want to say more focal or smaller, you can see how we're starting to get the stress to this outer retina. That's not a good sign. You know, cellular damage, cellular, you know, you know that type of uh, photoreceptor damage. If you follow the mitochondria line, it's really good to write about here. This is not a bad scan. You're getting photoreceptor disruption, potentially death here. This is a little bit worse of a visual prognosis that's out there. All right. So here, if you look at this one, this looks like a vitreo macular adhesion. But if you look right there, you have a little distortion, a little disruption. So you quickly change out from vitreomacular adhesion to vitreomacular traction, and that's focal. You know, these OCTs are very uh, expensive, but it's worth, you know, spending the extra $10,000 and getting the ones that label where all the disease is. Um, that usually works a little bit better in a live audience because I usually hear a chuckle. So hopefully I had a few people chuckle over that. Um, you know, it's, it's, these are obviously labeled, um, but here you can see that vitreomacular adhesion up oh, as soon as you get to there and you have that distortion and that change to that morphology now it becomes a vitreomacular traction. And this one here is, you have know, multiple vitreomacular tractions. Here's one right here. You have distortion. You can maybe say that there's one right here. There's definitely, you know, this from about here, whoops. From about here to about here is about 1500 microns. So this, these are all focal. There's a focal one here. You can maybe say there's a smaller focal one here. You can see that that posterior vitreous out attached right here. So this is just vitreomacular traction. You can see the, the cysts that have occurred. But, you know, this patient coming in, they might say, look, if I cover my eyes, doc, it looks clear in one eye versus the other. But if you would refract them, I would say based on this anatomy of this outer retina, they should be 2020, 2025 at worst. Um, and this would be your reason why uh, would be this uh, vitreomacular traction. So here's you know, scan number five. The key is you always got to look at all the scans. It could take time to kind of, sometimes the data is cubed. It's a big cube of data. Sometimes it's line data. But you need to take a look. Maybe if you look at all these other ones, it looks like vitreomacular adhesion, but now you have a little bit of attraction there. But then when you look at number four here on this scan, you can see the vitreomacular traction. You can see the stress that's occurring to this outer retina and the potential for vision loss. Um, you're still gonna monitor these um, closely. This might be a two or three month follow-up, giving them an AMSR grid, calling you if they have any sudden vision changes that's out there. You can see that's you know nice focal. This is usually, you can see this is 250 microns this way. So you can just see how many 250 microns this way it would take. So definitely if you just use this gauge here, you know, it's a little bit over 250, that's 300 microns well as what we call a focal vitreomacular traction. And you can just see here, it's kind of like a little double epiretinal membrane and what's happening here. But again, the outer retina is being preserved. Shouldn't be that bad of an acuity uh, for this patient. This is nothing more than just kind of showing off. I think this is a 12 millimeter uh, <clears throat> yeah, scan. Um, and you can just see what's happening here uh, with the posterior vitreous, the liquefaction that has occurred, still attached here. Uh, nothing more than kind of showing off uh, what some of these instruments can do. Uh, and again, it's just another vitreomacular traction because you have the change to the, to the retina morphology. So let's jump into full thickness macular holes. Um, you know, we talked about vitreomacular adhesions. We talked about vitreomacular tractions. And then a full thickness macular hole is defined as a foveal lesion with disruption of all the retinal layers from the internal ling limiting membrane all the way down to the RPE. And that becomes big as we start looking at lamellar holes. Uh, is it a true full thickness macular hole? 
Uh, and uh, you'll see here, when I grew up, I would learned about stage 1A, 1B, uh, stage two, small hole, large hole. Stage four was a full thickness with a total release. Stage three was a large hole, but still had the PVD. And we called it one, two, three, and four. And then I still have kind of the senior retina guys that I work with still calling it stage one, two, and three. And then I have, you know, the younger retina guys that are coming out of school. Yeah, they're calling it small, medium, full thickness with or without VMT. And I'm like, where did this all come from? And it's from this paper right here in 2013, where they're the international VMT traction study, or maybe they're using kind of the older terminology, but there's the bridge right there uh, if you're looking for that bridge. So when you're looking at the, you're calling it small, medium, or large, less than 250 microns would be a small from 250 to 400 is medium. And that's going from a, a, a linear width across the hole. And here's the key right here at the narrowest point. So you're using the narrowest point, not usually at the internal limiting membrane. It's usually a little bit deeper into, as we'll see in some scans, less than 250 small, greater than 400 is, is microns, is large and anything in between, and then with or without VMT. So pretty straightforward. You can see here that this is without a vitreomacular traction. You can see here, if we would measure this, this is greater than uh, 400 microns. So this is a large full thickness all the way down. Look, it's all the way down to the RPE. And so we have a, a full thickness macular hole, large full thickness without a vitreomacular traction. Here's another one, but now it's small. Right, this is a small, uh, uh, full thickness macular hole without uh, a VMT, without a vitreomacular traction. So it's got, not by here. You don't go up here. You go by the narrowest uh, edge. So if you want to send a you know a letter to your retinologist and kind of show them what's going on, uh, that's what you can. Uh, you know, that's the that's how you can send your letters. So let me launch this here. And let me see what I'm asking here. It says, the patient has a macular hole in one eye. The patient wants to know the chance of happening to the other eye. What is your reply? You know, so right, we just diagnosed a macular hole. And you're going to you know, give the bad news to the patient. And you say, hey, look, the good news is we can fix this. They, you know, they go out, they'll do a vitrectomy. They'll do what they have to do. You might put a gas bubble in. You might have to go face down. So, you know, most of the time during that conversation, they'll say, oh, geez, what's the chance of this happening to my other eye? You know, like, you know, heck yeah, it's happened to your first eye, you know, uh, yeah, it can happen to your other eye, right? Um, you know, or, you know, hey, you feeling lucky or unlucky because, you know, I really don't know. Or is it, you know, 6%, 54% or does it depend on the OCT finding? So I see Joel uh, weighed in with E. Peter asked there, what do you do? What do you do with PVD treatment? Um, I really don't do anything with PVD treatment. Uh, Joe, I know down in Florida, I've been down there. As you know, I love lecturing in Florida. I was down six times this year to get out of the cold winter months. I know of a few docs down there, maybe lasering PVDs, um, anything with regard to that, you do it in your practice, Joe, or what thoughts on that? Uh, my thoughts on that is I, I, I don't advocate it. Uh, if you have a very bad PVD, you can uh, try to blast it, but you have risk from laser energy. You're making one big floater into several smaller floaters. I don't think that it's uh, it's very effective. In two in the two years that I have been in my practice, I have referred one person uh, to our uh, retina team for a vitrectomy because the PVD and the floaters were really very very bad, and uh, shockingly they talked him out of it. Yeah, the. Um... Yeah, I haven't had any lasering. Uh, about my end is about one a year where someone comes in with just a PVD. It's in that 
you know, that focal spot, focal point in the eye floating through there, driving the patient crazy. It's our dominant eye. I probably have about one N a year going to the retinologist to get a vitrectomy, <laughs> but you know, that puts the patient at higher risk for other things. So, uh, uh, that's why it's such a low uh, procedure that's out there. Yeah, most of the time I I dissuade them. Sometimes I scoff at it because they're I can tell they're a little bit overreactionary based upon what I see. And I said I, I I had one person within within two years. I mean it it, it was so bad. I I I recommended it, and uh, our retinal surgeon still talked them out of it. Yeah. So I share in the poll results here, you know, I see about nine, basically 97%, even 98%. Uh, like the lucky two, two people went with the lucky. Um, it depends on the OCT findings. So that's, you know, the one answer, but 54% could be correct. And 6% could be correct uh, based on the literature uh, that's out there. So, you know, make sure you review the other eye carefully, because if you have a vitreomacular traction, then depending on uh, the study that you read that's out there, I've seen it as low as 20%. I'm putting the highest risk that I found out there that when you have a vitreomacular traction, it's as high as 54%. If you have no traction or you have a PVD, then it's the highest that I found was 6%. So that's why, you know, zero to 6% could be a correct answer. 54% could be correct. It all depends on what you're finding on the OCT. So that's really where when someone asks that question, you need to have an OCT to be able to give them the answer. And, you know, most of the time when you do an OCT, you're getting both. And again, here's my buddy Duker again in this, gr this group. You know, Fujimoto is another one of those inventors of the OCT. And basically saying the macular hole free survival after 48 months was 94%. So if they didn't have a, a PVD uh, and it was, you know, negative, that's like 94%. But again, here's 54% for patients that had you know, a vitreomacular traction. So, yeah, you know, just have to kind of look at the OCT and kind of guide the patient. So, you know, what about the other eye? You know, an impending hole. Uh, I don't like calling it an impending hole because impending kind of sounds like it's coming, it's going to happen. But the, the, again, despite the name, it can spontaneously resolve uh, that's out there. So, here, is this a macular hole? Polling question number four. Let me see if I can get it up and running. And the quick yes or no. Is this a macular hole? Yes or no? Don't see anything rolling in the chat box. I think we're all caught up. Unless you have anything, uh, anything going to you directly. Yep, nothing private. No one's looking to come in. All right, so it looks like we're slowing down on the answers here. We're at about 72%. Uh, try and answer everyone out there to try and keep it interactive. I see no directly coming to me. I have a B saying no. All right, so let me just end this poll, share the results. And uh, if I was uh, using a lifeline and go with my friends, I would say uh, they, you know, 62%. Remember, it's not a, uh, it's not a macular hole uh, by definition from the uh, international uh, uh, vitreo uh, macular traction study. Uh, because you have tissue here, right? We can see the outer retina. And I love looking at this. This would, in a sense, I think I have it over here. This would be a lamellar hole because the layers, this, you can learn a lot from here. Remember, the, the, in the, in, when we get to angiography, you're going to see that the superficial plexus, the deep plexus are here, loose association. That's why you see exudates and blood kind of pull to this area 
uh, when you have diabetic retinopathy. So if you're looking for diabetic retinopathy, leakage on a B scan, I'm a big advocate of making sure that you pick up diabetic retinopathy on an angiography beforehand, but you can see this is more of a lamellar hole uh, that's out there. And you can read this definition of a lamellar hole you know, an irregular foveal contour, the defect is in the inner fovea. Um, you can have a splitting. There's your schesis right there and maintenance of an intact photoreceptor layer. So if you go down here to the external limiting membrane, you can see again, the mitochondrial line or the, um, the ellipsoid zone. You can see the myoid zone and the RPE. So those, those photoreceptors are intact, making this a lamellar hole. Now, I like this because you can see I've kind of highlighted four scans here, number nine through 12. If I was interpreting number 12, I would say, oh, there's really nothing big going on here other than a macula schesis. That's what you would call that. And over here, you would call this one on number 10 just by changing from 12, this scan to 10. Now you have a lamellar hole. You can see there's a hole and you can see this is a very small lamellar hole here. Uh, on this nasal side, a little bit more of a lamellar separation on the nasal side. And then jumping down here, more of a, another schesis, a foveal schesis, because you still have that intact in, uh, internal limiting membrane. And here it's kind of a mix of what you could call it. Maybe it's dissolved enough. Maybe you could call this a lamellar hole or still a macula schesis because there's intact. This one's not as clear cut. I could probably call this a bunch of different uh, names here. Definitely a lamellar hole, macula schesis, macula schesis here, depending on what scan you're looking at. You can see here what's happened with this, um, with this scan. Um, this was something that I pulled from OCT Connect. Someone put it on there. I just kind of labeled. You can see here kind of the the uh, the epiretinal membrane kind of kind of maturing and, and just kind of yanking open, creating a lamellar hole. The, uh, you still have the external limiting membrane, the myoid zone, the ellipsoid zone, the photoreceptors are intact. Maybe just the earliest the sign of a lamellar hole starting uh, on this side, on the in, in a sense, the nasal side, because uh, you can see it's a little thicker here but definitely the lamellar, the temporal side here has a, a lamellar separation. So I just kind of labeled it for a person. You have a epiretinal membrane traction, the inner retina, the outer retina, here's your epiretinal membrane. And I would have guessed that the intact photoreceptor integrity line, mitochondrial line, this patient should be 2025 <clears throat> or uh, 2020. So a pseudo hole come as a, just another definition that comes out. Um, again, there's no loss of foveal tissue uh, as observed with a lamellar hole or a full thickness. So the key is there's no loss of tissue. You have invaginated or heaped foveal edges. You have a concomitant epiretinal membrane with a central opening. You have a steep macular contour, and again, no loss to retinal tissue. So this here would be a fovea, this would be a pseudo hole. You can see that uh, you have the epiretinal membrane, there's really no tearing, no lamellar splitting, but you're losing the foveal pit, right? So you have the heaped foveal edges, you have a concomitant epiretinal membrane, steep macular contour, loss of the kind of that central foveal, that nice smooth pit. But again, you see no loss of tissue. This one here meets the requirements. You can call it an epiretinal membrane, epiretinal membrane with a pseudo hole uh, type of, but there's no lamellar hole. There's no full thickness macular hole, but you're going to monitor these patients for those changes as those vitreous dynamics and this membrane, again, remember it matures. And I learned that from working with a retinologist, if they were going to peel an epiretinal membrane, you know, it's, it's like, it's like jello. Think of like when you make jello um, and you just put it in the bowl and you're trying to scoop it out with a fork. Well, that's kind of hard to do because it's still liquidy, but if you put it in the fridge forever, you know, 30 minutes, an hour, whatever it takes to kind of gel up, 
Now you can stick a fork in and take a fork full out. That's how the retinologists like to peel those membranes when they're a little bit more mature. So it's not kind of shredding on them as they're taking it out. And uh, again, here, this was labeled Does someone put this on OCT connect. And I just kind of took my, whatever my iPad and it has that pen and I can draw on it and make some notes. All right. So let's see how we're doing here. We're about, uh, we're about 50 minutes in here, maybe an hour into this. Um, this is not going to go um, as a polling question. We're going to use the chat box here. Uh, so if people want to put some uh, answers in there. Um, this is a full thickness macular hole with what, you know, you can see there's a couple things here. You got a, you got a release of there's, you know, there's no vitreomacular traction. You've got the full thickness macular hole. You can see a little hyper reflective column. That's not always a great sign because that might be a little bit of damage to this, to this RPE. But uh, I see with schesis, I like schesis. There's definitely an operculum. I like it. Small macular hole without VMT, but a lamellar separation chat. I think I love that definition. People that are putting schesis. Yeah, I, there's definitely a schesis. I would maybe call this more of a lamellar hole, but it's definitely a macular schesis, so separation. But I like teaching this because look at the loose adhesion. Imagine if you had some leaky capillaries where this would pull. So good. Yeah, I like, love it. So schesis with a perculum, schesis with a perculum. Uh, thanks for using the chat box here. Full thickness macular hole with schesis. Absolutely. Uh, love it. Jim, I see it there. A perculum. Yep. And you can see the PVD here. And again, depending on maybe what scan you're looking at here, maybe it would change. But looking at this one, I love it. So thanks, guys, for uh, using the chat box and keeping that uh, interactive. All right. You know, just ask yourself, you know, what's your diagnosis here? Um, I can look down here and I see looks like a vitreomacular adhesion. This at this cut looks like it's separated. But what I like to kind of think about after doing this for years and teaching it and seeing a lot of things on OCT Connect, you know, that inner retina can take a lot of stretching, pulling. That outer retina, I kind of think of it as that sacred cemetery. You don't want to go in and tip over the tombstones. It's just a cemetery. Leave it alone. It's sacred. And what I didn't like is if you see how this kind of comes down here, this kind of focal, now it's a vitreomacular traction for one reason. Look what's happening out here to this outer retina. You're starting to get this little bit. I'll move my arrow. You're getting this disruption. Again, I don't like the outer retina being played with. Play around with the inner retina all you want. I see Julia putting a PED uh, question mark. While pigmented epithelial detachment would be the retinal pigmented epithelium detachment. So I'm seeing this kind of above that. It's a great comment, Julia, that's out there, but it's above it. It's, it's more of a, you know, a retina schesis, but to the outer retina. And I didn't like it. So uh, it's more of a vitreomacular traction because of that, that outer retina. So I followed it eight weeks and look what happened. Look what it started to happen here. I didn't like what was happening. It just, the spider senses didn't, I didn't like what was happening here. Same, you know, this is the patient here. Eight weeks later, look, a small, full thickness macular hole with a vitreomacular traction. And this was awesome because the patient was able to get over to the retinologist and get their, get their surgery um, before you know, there was a lot of atrophy or damage or getting to being a large hole. This patient, you know, within a few months, was back to 2020 vision. And then we had to deal with the cataract formation that occurs with a vitrectomy and about nine months later. And then about 15 months in it, they were back again to be in 2020 uh, with, and being pseudophagic from, from the procedure. But we maintained and followed it, but I don't like when the outer retina is being uh, involved. Here's a 30-year-old woman. She comes in right whenever COVID started, March 17th, right? So that was right about when it was all hitting the fan. 
And I didn't like it. Yeah, you know, she's coming in just for contact lens eval. And I'm like, oh, 30 years old. Look at this traction. It's a focal vitreomacular traction. She's young. She's going to be stuck down. Oh, you know, yeah. You know, and that's why I was in my mind. I'm not doing that to the patient. I'm just like, yeah, you know, we better just watch it. But the outer retina, that sacred part, it's intact. It's just more inner retina. So I said, you know, come back. We'll check us out six or eight weeks. Depending on what we see there, we'll follow it, blah, blah, blah. But uh, you can see here, I measured it for her as I'm doing another scan. Here's one scan here. Again, you kind of have to scroll through, click around. This scan here is this right here. You can see it's 455 microns. Again, it's a focal uh, vitreomacular traction. Uh, brought her back. And you can see here in this scan, then she released and her foveal pit went back. So that was one of those. And that was just a few months, you know, a few weeks later, as you can see. So her vitreomacular traction released. To my surprise, that's why I don't guess. That's why I just follow these. I thought she was 30. Everything's stuck down. She's going to tear open. She's going to have, you know, retinal issues. And, you know, within two months, she let go. So really weird. Uh, not a real high myope. Not sure why someone 30 years old is getting uh, this type of uh, presentation. All right. Next one. Uh, this is February 15th of uh, right before COVID. Uh, you can see vitreomacular traction. I measured it. It's 500 and, or 495 microns. Here's the other eye. Uh, so we just wanted to follow it. Here's the wide field imaging. Looks like there's a PVD right there. And it went away. So we do like following them. We do see them disappear. We do see them turn into issues. You know, so this is cases why we like to uh, uh, follow these patients and, and uh, you know, follow them appropriately in a sense. We're not overbilling and uh, we're following them to see if they're going to get any release or get, in the, get themselves into problems where we can get them to the retinologist. A lot of people ask if I refer. No, I can follow these just as well as the retinologist can uh, until they need treatment. So take a look at this patient here. You can see a big PVD. Um, you can see we have, eh, we got a break in the internal limiting membrane. So you can in a sense, maybe call this a lamellar hole, definitely a macula schesis. This right here, this cut is a macula schesis. Macula schesis, maybe you can talk me into calling this a lamellar hole, uh, what's happening here. Um, you can see that there's traction going on. You can see the PVDs that have created uh, this type of OCT finding. Right here, this looks like it's a break all the way through. So I would call this a lamellar hole. All right, OCT, retinal angiography. Let's jump into that. And then Joe, maybe around you know 9.40, if I'm still kind of harping on OCT and geography, let's just make sure I get to the plaquenil toxicity. That's usually helpful for, uh, for, uh, for the attendees. I'm right too. All right, so OCT and geography. It requires an injection of dye. It does not require an injection or, uh, or a dye. And uh, how was uh, was she a high myope? Yeah, Marguerite, that was back whenever I think I kind of mentioned it. Um, um, not a real high myope in that patient, that thirty year old. You know, you know, it depends on what you call high. She was like three fifty minus three fifty minus four. Um, I wouldn't really expect too much change. What I probably should have done is I probably should have measured her axial length, um, and maybe that would have explained something. But uh, that just would have been purely uh, academic in a sense. All right, everyone's cruising in on this one. So I'm just gonna end the poll. And uh, I'm gonna kind of tell you a funny story here just to kind of drive this question home. Um, you know, I did a hour, two hour lecture somewhere. And, you know, there was a nice reception that night at the bar or at the, uh, in the exhibit hall, they had a bar, kind of some, some snacks, some hors d'oeuvres and, and some having a beer and everyone's coming up, Hey, nice lecture. Help me out. Blah, 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 blah. And then a couple of people said, uh, 
you know, hey, what type of dye do they use for that angiography? And I must have said it like 30 times during the, like, listen, guys, there's no dye needed uh, for OCT angiography. Um, uh, and that's okay if you didn't know now, because, you know, seven people uh, said, you know, no dye. That's why we're here tonight to learn. But it's after I said it 30 times during the lecture, someone comes up to me and goes, you know what? You know, I kind of missed, like, what dye are they using for the... There's no dye, 70,000 scans per second, you know, in three seconds, 210 scans. What happens is you're able to pick up what's moving and not moving white blood cells, red blood cells, and different proteins that are in that blood. So it's a non-invasive uh, procedure, uh, no fluorescein or indocyanogreen. It's, it's free of any dyes. Basically, it's just scanning at 70,000 scans per second. So when you look at the retina and you have this kind of on FOS, we've kind of did, talked about it a little bit. The inner retina has the blood supply. The outer retina is in a sense is avascular. And then you get down to the choriocapillaris and to the choroid. So those blood vessels, those, sorry, those, those, those photoreceptors need the blood that's above and the blood that's down below. So you know, in this instrument, you can call it the superficial plexus, which is the internally limiting membrane down to the uh, inner plexiform layer, and then inner nuclear layer to the outer plexiform layer. You got the deep capillary plexus. And then you got that, uh, that uh, avascular zone. I'm gonna say that again when we talk about the foveal avascular zone, but the photoreceptor, that outer retina is really free of any blood. And then you got the choriocapillaris. So three to 15 microns below, 15 to 70 microns below, get down to that outer retina and then you get to the choriocapillaris. You can kind of see where we are using the B scan and the A scan here. So in this question here, is there a choroidal neovascular membrane? And again, you can see I paid the extra you know, $10,000 to get that upgrade. Right here, looking at this patient with macular degeneration, these are drusenoid PEDs. So someone asked earlier, is it a PED? This would be a PED, but not a serous PED. This would be drusen, drusenoid PED. But right here at this arrow, do you see a choroidal neovascular membrane? Um, Yes, oops, I didn't launch it. Yes, no, um, or there must be since you're asking. All right. So rolling in nicely, nothing is, no questions, nothing here. No private questions on your end, Joe? No, no sure. good. All right. So I'm gonna end this poll, kind of keep us moving along, share the results. And uh, yes, no, and must be since I'm asking. So I like that, that's probably the best. You know, I look at these all the time. And there is no way in looking at this B scan OCT that I would say, hey, you know, I'm going to get you to your retinologist, or I think you have a choroid on the avascular membrane. Um, I see a couple hyperreflective columns, which is telling me that there's some RPE damage. That's kind of some advanced AMD interpretation. Maybe we'll do that some night uh, as a webinar uh, or interactive distance learning. But looking at this, I would never say that there is a, uh, is, a, is a membrane there. Now, if I take away and show you this part of the angiography, you can definitely see down where this arrow is that there is a choroidal neovascular membrane, which leads me into polling question number eight. And I'm going to launch that one here. Would and sodium fluorescein angiography identify this choroidal neovascular membrane? Yes or no? This is found with, uh, this here is found with an OCT angiography. Nice big membrane here. 
it's an occult. You could say it's type one. It's below the RPE. Would a sodium fluorescein angiography identify this? And I see a few people replying, no, I haven't shared the results. I haven't ended the poll. If you say no, why not? I guess maybe put it in a chat box. If you say no, why not? So I'm gonna end the poll. And that's what I love about webinars. Cause when I do the live, I can kind of play off of what's, you know, what's out there. Um, you know, I was in the same boat. I was thinking that the sodium fluorescein angiography would find this. I was in this, you know, the 66% at one point. And uh, there's really, this is not going to be seen by a sodium fluorescein angiography if you'd run it on a patient. Um, and I see uh, Michael Tran here. You can see it with other uh, uh, maybe uh Cyano green, so uh, uh, of an angiography with uh, with the cyano green dye rather than sodium fluorescein. So you're not going to see it really for two reasons. The the two reasons, and and Dr. Tran here is kind of highlighting it. Sodium fluorescein cannot see below the RPE. That's one reason. The other reason is it's not leaking. Right, sodium fluorescein works on leaking. How many times have you seen a patient not knowing that they had this because you don't have angiography, you don't have these images, you see this patient, you're looking at them, you're saying, hey, it looks like your macular degeneration is hanging in there, do all that lifestyle change, so on and so forth. And you say, okay, I'll see you back six, nine, 12 months, whatever you're doing for the patient. And they come back two months later and they bled, it's because they had this thing right here. And we call that an occult non-exudative choroidal neovascular membrane, right? This is occult, it's below the RPE, it's non-leaking, and it's a choroidal neovascular membrane. And again, not to be able to be seen. So this has been fun. I can tell you that I've worked with my retinologist since I've been having angiography in my practice for about six years you know, what to do for these patients. You're going to see coming up here that they're 15.2 times, you know, this technology is ahead of the treatment. All we know, it's 15.2 times more likely to bleed. So I've had a handful of these patients. I sent them to the retinologist and they go, Greg, I, I can put an you know, anti-VEGF in there, but it's risk of retinal attachment, end optimitis, da, 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 da. We don't have that double-blinded study, that evidence-based medicine, that outcome-based medicine that we're looking for. And like my first three patients within like a nine month period, they bled. So I had to have a little, go out to have a cup of coffee, with my retinologist and say, look, we need to do something better. I understand evidence-based medicine, blah, 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 double-blinded studies, but we're picking up on this technology. We're picking up on this. We got to do something better. So what I started doing is following them closer. And if I can prove that they're growing quickly over time, my retinologist will inject them from time to time, depending on the situation. Sometimes we can see them kind of just sit there and never really develop. And obviously we're not going to inject those and put them at risk. So that's kind of a, something you'll have to work with, with your retinologist in your area. If you have this instrument, what to do for these patients, because all we know is they're 15.2 times. Now this one's easy. This is an occult. You can see the fluid and it's leaking, but you can just see here how the instrument found the choroidal neovascular memory. This one will get an injection. It's leaking. This one won't. Maybe, maybe it will, depending on your retinologist. That one is not, in a sense, required because we don't have the evidence-based medicine. This one will. This will get an Avastin or whatever the biologic agent of choice is for the patient and the doctor. I like this one here. You know, here are the uh, drusen, large drusen, uh, you can see the drusenoid PEDs, maybe fluid, maybe not, maybe just some atrophy, uh, but I was able to run an, uh, an angiography on this patient. And you can see now when you use, when, I know this is kind of um, 
uh, a newer course maybe for some or newer technology, but this is blood flow. And you really shouldn't have drusenoid like here. This is not the angiography turned on. You turn on the angiography. Notice how this is in a sense hollow, hollow, hollow. They're non-vascularized uh, PEDs. This one is. This one is the suspicious one. And notice how maybe that's a little bit of fluid. The fluorescein, the endocyanogreen green angiography was a little vague uh, on this. And look what happens when you run the OCT angiography. Now, a lot of people, you know, a lot of us will use, you know, which we should, we play well with them now. Things are becoming nicer, ophthalmology. But ophthalmology, retinologists are end-stage disease. A lot of times they'll be like, uh, I called up my retinologist and I asked him if I should get an angiography and they said no, OCT angiography. Remember, most retinologists are end stage. Where are we as optometrists? We're more early detection and hopefully prevention in some areas, but this is really optometry's instrument. It's not saying that it's not ophthalmology's instrument. It's just saying that we see people, presbyopia coming in earlier, younger, and we can detect things like this and find these choroidal neovascular membranes. So, you know, if you're going to ask, you know, if you should get one of these or not, ask like-minded individuals. You know, I was thinking about getting a Tesla. I don't think I was going to buy, ask a BMW owner uh, out there. I'd probably ask a Tesla owner. So if you're thinking about getting one of these, ask someone who maybe has an angiography that's out there. This is and just Greg, a reminder. Oh, do Greg, I have a, a question yes. came in. How often do you OCTA your AMD patients? Do you do anything for high risk patients or we do routinely run the OCTA on a certain interval or only if they're, a, only if they're symptomatic? I mean, how yeah. do you do it, Greg? Yeah, that's a great question, Mindy. I see that question that's out there. Um, I, I kind of went through that maturation process, Mindy, and the rest of the people that are attending here tonight. You know, I was trying to be like smart about it and do it in the high risk. And if I saw like, like here, you can see these hyper uh, fluorescent columns. I always like looking at the choroid for macular degeneration patients, seeing those hyper reflective columns. It means the RPE is breaking down that coherent lights getting down through there. I can tell you that I scan everyone now because I find these little occult membranes. Now this one here, I can tell you, I sat on this one for a while and maybe it even atrophied and went away. If you get the patient on good nutrition and you get the patient on maybe some good supplements, you can get some of these things to reverse. But many a long drawn out way, I started by imaging some, I image all AMD patients because you can get fooled by things like this. How many of you would think that this patient is, ah, there's no way that this could be a choroidal neovascular membrane in here. And when you do the angiography, you look and you see, let's go back, you see that, you see how this is highlighting right here. And whenever you do a six by six and zoom in with a three by three, you can see the choroidal neovascular membrane that's there. So I've learned in things like this, to just image everyone, because you can find things. Now, the fun part is, is like, now what do you do? And these you can sit on, you can try and get them on better nutrition, diet and lifestyle, all that fun stuff that we know, um, proper supplementation. I'm a big about using like resveratrol and quercetin for that outer retina. Uh, and you can see some of these disappear. So for that, there's a great timing, Mindy, for that question, because there you can see, I never would have thought to image that unless I was imaging everyone. Um, this is just kind of showing off the instrument uh, here. Let me get into some diabetes uh, so then I can get to probably in about 15 minutes, get to the Plaquenil um, uh, cases, uh, the case of a Plaquenil so you can kind of see it. Now you heard me talk a lot about the retina here, the outer retina, I'll just use this. This is an avascular area of the photoreceptor. I'm gonna kind of use the same terminology here in diabetes, but we're using the foveal avascular zone. And the foveal avascular zone, a lot of people will ask me like, what's the normal size? 
I can tell you that there's really shouldn't, you shouldn't try and put a normal size. I still hear lectures to this day saying, oh yeah, 0 0.25, 0 0.1, da, 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 0 0.172 is a normal eye here. The key that I'm going to tell you is symmetry. One eye could be 0 0.4 and the other eye should be with pretty darn close to that 0 0.4. In another patient, it could be 0 0.1 and 0 0.1. The key is inter-eye symmetry is the key. But what I want to point out here, this is a patient with diabetes. You can dilate this patient. You could uh, take photos as we did here. You can do a B scan and it all looks normal. This was their foveal avascular zone. And if you think about it, if this is avascular here, this edge right in here is probably the thinnest amount of capillaries that you have. And then as you get out, it gets a little thicker because you're going from nothing to something. So like right in here is your thinnest area, which is now going to be very susceptible to uh, the, the, the toxins that are made, sorbitol and dulcetol, during that diabetic crisis, in a sense, when the sugar is high. And right there is a microaneurysm. Right there is a microaneurysm. So let's go through and show you some cases. Well, I still have one more favorite thing to show you here. Just look at the blue lakes. Few blue lakes here. Blue lakes is avascular. You're gonna have some in this normal retina. This is probably a little bit more than in someone with diabetes in 2015. Notice how the blue lakes have increased. Notice how this retina has become more ischemic, non-capillary perfusion. But let's look at the B scan. Remember I told you we had to learn where we had to look, the inner retina, outer retina, loose association. Look right here. See this, how it's kind of creating a block. It's absorbing that coherent light. You can't really tell. It's, it's hyperfluorescent. It's exudator blood. It's one or the other because that hyperfluorescent fluid is black. We see it as cysts all the time. But if you go across and you look, look how much capillary dropout you had to have before you saw it on the B scan. So I'm a big about early detection. We all go for our colonoscopies. If you haven't go, if you have you know, mammographies, capillaries is what you need to look at for diabetes. You know, looking at the, like an OCT wellness, we do this quite a bit in our practice. We offer this as a kind of an add-on to that routine exam. Uh, we, we have about a 70 to 80% capture rate. We get a GCC, we get a B scan. What I want to highlight here is the foveal avascular zone. See how I say that they should be pretty close? I look at this here. This should be 0 0.1 with each other. This one's 02. See how this one's 0 0.19, 0 0.21. These should be very similar. You can see nice and tight, nice and tight. This is a patient without diabetes. Here's a patient with diabetes. And everything looks great on the B scan. You can look all day long at this B scan. Maybe something's showing up right here now that we know that the patient is diabetic or has diabetes. But notice how this is 0 0.35 and 0.2. And you always want to look at the bigger one. The bigger one's probably expanding. And take a look at how this is irregular. And this is kind of still round and tight but I'm gonna take this image here and blow it up over here. Look at the capillary dropout, capillary dropout, capillary dropout, and the foveal avascular zone is becoming distorted. This patient has diabetic retinopathy. I'm the third party chair for POA, been in for 20 years. I work with UPMC, Highmark, Geisinger, Medicare, Medicaid, and every payer said it's diabetic retinopathy. So you can code it for diabetic retinopathy. Someone asked, what do I charge for my angio wellness report? Um, we're not doing anything collusion here. We're not telling you what to charge or whatever. You've asked the question. We do a, a wide field imaging. We do this wellness and we charge $70 for it. But you can charge whatever you want out there. We are not price fixating here. So nothing's being colluded. All right. So... This patient has diabetic retinopathy. Here's another patient that when we go down here and we look, you can see this is 0.29, this is 0.39. It's about 10. Why is this one larger 
And if you look closely, you can see the capillary changes that are occurring. You can even see the capillary changes occurring in both eyes. This patient has diabetic retinopathy picked up on the angiography way before, maybe here, maybe here now that we know the patient's diabetic. Maybe we can say there's some leakage here, but if you go across, they have a vitreomacular traction right there uh, on this. There's a vitreomacular adhesion in this eye, vitreomacular traction, maybe some diabetic retinopathy, but definitely diabetic retinopathy when you look at the foveal vascular zone. Now, you don't always, this is why I love here, you don't always have to go by these numbers. You got to interpret the whole OCT. See how this is 22 and 20, but there's something funny looking going on right here. You come up here, whoa, what's going on here? You got some macular edema. So when we take a closer look at this patient, and this is the on foss, you can see the exudate, the blood that's leaked out into this retina. Look at the capillary damage that has occurred, the microaneurysms. You can see the exudate and the blood here that's hyperfluorescent, the, the edema as the uh, cystic spaces here. Look at the capillary dropout that has occurred. Look at the dropout here, dropout here. This patient has a pretty advanced diabetic retinopathy. Let me show you a case here. This is a 29-year-old man with diabetes. He's in for his yearly diabetic exam. No changes to his vision. His hemoglobin A1C is 8.6. I can tell you that the PCPs have called me up and said, Greg, what the heck do you have over there? What do you mean? What the heck do I have over there? You know, Johnny, who wouldn't do his hemoglobin A1C, is now taking it more serious. Oh, probably because I identified the capillary dropout in his eyes, pointed out that it's happening in his kidneys, his liver, his brain, everywhere else in the body where there's capillaries. So um, if he wants to have a good quality of life, probably be a good idea to try and get the sugar under control, maybe get onto some good uh, nutrition. So here we are uh, with an 8.6. I don't like it. He's 20, 20, he's 29 years old. We already have some proliferative diabetic retinopathy, but if you take a look at his retinas, they don't look too, too bad. And maybe a hemorrhage right here. Macula looks pretty good. Some hemorrhaging here, maybe. Look at the B scan where we told you where to look. Maybe something going on right here. Coming across, looking pretty good. Maybe something going on here. But if you look at these B scans, they don't look too, too bad. Here, this B scan can pick up some fluid. And here we can see some hyperfluorescent. This is either blood or exudate. You'd have to look into your microscope. But when you start looking at the, it, the superficial plexus and the deep plexus, this is where diabetes is here. Diabetes here, macular degeneration over here. So when we start looking at the scans, that was the right eye. This is the left eye. Now, one of the proprietary things that OptiView has is you have the ability to measure. I can tell you that I did angiography for two years before they came out with this tool, and it was tough. It was like, ugh. like I thought this was going to be awesome. They have this little measuring tool right here. The other instruments are supposed to be having it. I've been hearing it for two or three years, but you click on this little thing. It says measure, and you can turn on the foveal vascular zone, and you can see that it makes these a little bit easier to interpret. And when you turn this on, you can see that the dropout and how that foveal vascular zone is becoming distorted. There is without no doubt that this patient has diabetic retinopathy. Back in the day, we were taught what I call the macro changes now, dot and blot hemorrhages, cotton wool spots, Irma. Now we're picking up on some micro changes. And we can, what's, it, what's that mean? Early detection right? You kind of hear me hammer. This is not prevention or wellness. This is just early detection where we can intervene and hopefully prevent vision loss for this patient. And here's the patient's other eye. When you look at this on FOSS, you can see the different type of leakage, blood or exudate, all these little things kind of highlighting up over here in the, uh, in the on FOSS, but you can see here the capillary dropout microaneurysm formation and again, remind this patient that, um, that they uh, um, have diabetic retinopathy and, uh, and they need to get, uh, you know, maybe see a nutritionist and so on and so forth. 
Um, how do you how do you present eye wellness scan to about seventy eight percent? It starts at the front desk. We have some terminology uh, that we use. Um, we don't really do an opt out method, but um, the, the 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 front desk is pretty good uh, in saying to the to the you know the, the doctors really highly recommend that they can see things beyond uh, what a routine eye exam can do. Um, do you perform OCT angiography in all diabetics or only if uh, again, back to, uh, that's how I used to do it. I kind of graduated into um, testing all patients with diabetes uh, because you can be surprised what's happening at that capillary level. And getting that early detection is great, uh, especially if they're running a little bit higher um, um, uh, hemoglobin A1C. And we all know that antioxidants work really well with diabetes. Um, uh, Paul Chow, uh, Stuart Richer, and Jeffrey Gerson did a really good paper on that. Um, and then we all know that omega-3s are very helpful. So I'm big about putting patients with diabetes on a good antioxidant and omega-3 supplementation. Hey, Greg, this, uh, this might be a reminder you, you wanted to uh, do some Plaquenil. Great. Perfect. So let me just show this case here of diabetes, and then we'll just move right into the Plaquenil, and we'll start to... You know, I fly a lot. We'll start uh, prepare this uh, plane for landing. We'll start getting the uh, the chair backs in the upright position. We'll get the uh, tray tables back and in the, into their position, and we'll be prepared to land here very shortly. Um, this 58 year old man with diabetes, new to the practice. Check us out. He's on three medications. Unsure of his blood sugar. Doesn't know the last hemoglobin A1C. And I can tell you that you might see little spots in here, but these retinas were perfectly clean. Wide field imaging was fine. You can look at the B scans here. They look great. This is a patient that we would say has no diabetic retinopathy. No diabetic retinopathy based on the technology that I would be using as a dilated exam, as a patient, or as a uh, um, a fundus photography and my B scan, but the crime's not been a, the punishment. So now I turn on the foveal avascular zone measurement and I can see now I'm starting to get some asymmetry. We're hitting that kind of that 0.1, this 24 right here is usually the one that's expanding. So we go and we take a little closer look at this patient and you can start to see the dropout that's occurring. You're not really getting any leakage over here, any exudates. But you can start to see in this patient, there's a little uh, microaneurysm right there. You can see the capillary drop out. You start to see some changes here, maybe some capillary changes here. Um, now it's time for this patient to get to know his blood sugar and his hemoglobin A1C. You know, early detection is what it's about, right? We, we all know about this. We all do our, our, our job in early detection. All right, so I'm gonna skip through this case. It's just another similar case of a patient that as you can see here, there's some microaneurysm changes. Hard to interpret these without having the, the angiolytics uh, that's out there. But if you turn it on, you can see here that there's some leakage in the onfoss. You can see what's happening with that foveal vascular zone, the capillary dropout in the right eye. A little bit worse in the left eye. Look at the, this dropout that's occurring uh, for this patient. And when you put them side by side, asymmetry is occurring. Look at the dropout, look at the microaneurysm formation. We need to help this 64 year old man uh, with diabetes. All right, so polling question number nine, this will be a good way to start landing this uh, plane. We'll go through Plaquenil toxicity and we'll get this uh, uh, landed. So question. Have you ever detected Plaquenil toxicity? Really simple, yes or no? All right, I see no, I see no, I see yes. I got a private one that says no. I see some rolling in. Is this not working? Share results. Number nine. Maybe we ended it. Stop sharing. Let's relaunch it. There we go. All right. They're rolling in now. 
All right, I'm going to end this. I see some yeses and some noes. We've got 71 of 106 people rolled in. Let me end it. Let me share it. And we have about one third that has and one third that hasn't. All right, maybe as we go through this tonight, maybe we can bump it up to 50 50 by the end of the year. So, you know, once you see this type of macular picture, you're just the horse is already gone. But I love showing this because you just need to know where the disease process is. <clears throat> As you can see here, the foveola and the fovea are pretty well preserved in this disease. It's more of a pair a and pair e, so pair a pair e foveal disease. So you got to know where to look on the OCT is where the foveal pit is, is where it's out to where the thickest part of that retina is. Then what happens is the hydroxychloroquine builds up into the RPE and then it becomes toxic uh, to, the, uh, to, to those uh, to the neurosensory retina causing it to thin. So plaquenil toxicity, um, many things have occurred. You can see 2002, uh, there were recommendations out there. And then 2011, there were recommendations and they were saying, hey, don't worry about, you know, you know, it's five to seven years. The typical dose is 200 milligrams uh, twice a day, 400 milligrams. It takes them five to seven years to get this 1,000 grams. I can tell you right now that bio-individuality is, is, is big, right? Someone can eat a banana and it spikes their sugar. Someone eats a banana, it doesn't spike their sugar. Someone does this, does that. Not everyone is created the same. And so I can tell you that I have a six man woman rheumatology practice right down the road, less than two miles. They do all kinds of study. That's a lot of the investigational studies that I do. We're doing a Sjogren study right now. I can tell you right now, I scan everyone every year, whether or not they're on it for six years or seven years. I've picked up Plaquenil toxicity three years of someone uh, taking Plaquenil. So my recommendation would be scan everyone. It's better to get catch it early than late. So these are uh, Larry Alexander slides. Uh, Larry Alexander, it's probably been now probably seven years ago that he passed away suddenly. But uh, he was a great teacher and he loved sharing things and he never let you hang up until he knew you understood it. Um, and so he shared these slides with me just to go out and teach. And this is just a reminder that you look for the disease in this para uh, perifoveal vascular zone. So, you know, when you're looking at um, these are, again, his slides, you know, you can use the uh, the GCC area to look at. And you can see here that there's. Again, here's the fovea. The disease is not in the fovea. It's in that para, para fovea area. Here is a patient that's getting plaquenil toxicity uh, just by using the GCC map. Um, and these are just his slides. Again, do you see the problem in the plaquenil zone, uh, thinning of the, of the plaquenil zone? There's uh, studies out there talking about the, the, this top hat or flying saucer. Basically, this is where the atrophy is. And that again, that para, paraphobia, it starts to fall. So it looks like there's a flying saucer. It looks like this is becoming elevated uh, that's out there. So again, this is the area where you want to look for the disease uh, in, the, in, these, in these conditions. And you can see here that there's some thinning you know, out here in these areas, but it's just tough to see. Uh, this early on. So I'll show you some, 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 some bad case, or this is a bad case here. This is again, a normal, just to remind us, just follow this outer nuclear layer. And then notice right here where it starts to thin. I don't think you would miss this one. You can see how it's coming crashing all the way down the outer retina in these cases. And the, even the even the mitochondria line, look at this. This is this patient's vision is going to be bad because the photoreceptors are disrupted. So this is kind of just a bad case of plaquenil toxicity. Um, this is kind of a funny story here. There's a horse under here uh, that Larry took, I guess, off the uh, internet. And 
some of these robots or spy bots uh, caught on to it and I had to pay $150 for some kind of patent infringement. So Larry got me from the grave for $150. Um, there's the horse right there and I'm just kind of covering it up uh, that's out there. So he was saying it's outside the barn. All right, let me show you a case here. 71 year old, and I just had one the other day and if I had time, I could have scanned it in here, but it's very similar. Just had a Plaquenil toxicity the other day. Now, I'm gonna give you a little pearl here. Again, remember I work with those uh, rheumatologists. I had probably about 18 months ago, someone come in 93 years old, having the earliest of changes of Plaquenil toxicity. Did we discontinue that patient's medication? We worked as a team and we decided to say no. The reason being she's 95, 93 years old, that's the best thing that's given her pain relief. I can follow her a little bit closer to make sure that she's not getting a ton of atrophy. Her eyes will probably outlive her um, unless she lives to be 150. And I guess it could happen. But uh, we kept her on the Plaquenil and I'm monitoring to her and we're getting very little change, if any, to the atrophy. We've picked it up and it's just kind of kind of cruising along. 71 years old probably going to stop it because, you know, I treat everyone as they're going to be 110. So now I got 40 more years to keep this person seen. Um, so you're going to see the Plaquenil toxicity on this patient. This was a patient with lupus and hypertension. You can see taking the standard dose, 200 milligrams twice a day. Sometimes I'll get people out during a live meeting, they'll say, why, if it's, you know, why don't, if they're, you know, uh, obese or heavier weight, why don't they give the higher dose? And if they're lighter, give a, a smaller dose. The answer to that is at that 200 milligrams twice a day, 400 milligrams a day is where you get that therapeutic dose of that pain relief, that anti-inflammatory. If you start weight adjusting it, it's kind of like aspirin. Aspirin at 81 milligrams gives you antiplatelet, but it doesn't do anything for inflammation, fever, uh, because it's not a high enough dose. So you hear about the age or weight adjusting it, but you don't weight adjust it because you need 200 milligrams twice a day to get that anti-inflammatory dose. That's the reason why you don't see them adjusting it uh, out there, even though lower weight and obesity drives up the Plaquenil toxicity. All right. So I said to this patient, look, you have Plaquenil toxicity. Um, she was 20, 25 due to mild cataracts. Um, so the, the story kind of went like this. Um, you know, we probably should think about stopping it. The PCP caught wind of what was going on, working with the retinologist. Hey, Greg's just that proverbial, just an optometrist. So I went and saw the retinologist, or went and saw the ophthalmologist. The retinologist says, hey, and I know Greg does a lot of lecturing. He's pretty good with some of this stuff, but I don't see what he's talking about here. Um, just stay on your medication. She got tired of, uh, um, after about three years of going there and sitting here for multiple hours um, and you know, kind of having scans and not being talked to, she eventually made it back to my office. So here she is uh, in 2016, um, or 2013, I made the diagnosis of Plaquenil toxicity. Here she is in 2016. Luckily, she doesn't have that bullseye appearance, right? So we told her she had Plaquenil toxicity in 2013. We take a look at the fundus uh, autofluorescence, really not seeing anything really showing up on those scans. And let me show you, remember, I'm going to show you a bunch of scans here. This is 2013 above. This is 2016 down below. And where we're going to do is, remember, we have to get to this, to this area right here, this periperiphobia. And look what has happened over a three-year period, 16 change and an 18 change. Now watch, this line's going to move as I click because you really want to make sure you're looking at the right area. You wanna be cutting through here, which is right here. And if you follow this area through here or follow this outer nuclear layer, why is this collapsing down? 
there's your plaquenil toxicity right there. Even though it might not look like a lot, there's your plaquenil toxicity. Why, if you follow this nuclear layer, why is it becoming thin here? And if you come over to this edge over here, you follow this nuclear layer and it starts to get again in this peri periphobial area, a little bit shaggy. So we told her that she had plaquenil toxicity. You know, it was a disagreement, but they come back a year later, take a look at, you can see a 16 and 18 change. You can definitely see. Now here's another um, uh, way I want, I'm trying to work with OptiView or any company that wants to try and do this. Take a look at this hill right here, which sled, which if you were sledding, would you rather sled ride down this hill? This looks like it's fun. Like, wow, woo, look how fast I can go down that. What happened to the hill here? See how this is collapsing? This is flat through here. That's because this is coming down. This is coming down. Maybe that's that top hat appearance. The VA of this patient, 2020 or 2025, it's unaffected. But we're seeing the change here, this 18 microns. Look at this one here. I'll go up one more. Look at what's happened through here. Look at how flat this has become. That's the right eye. It's a little bit easier to see it on the left eye. Let me get you to the, to the scan here. Right here is probably, see, we saw, we'll follow this through here, this outer nuclear layer. This is probably the easiest way. I probably pick up we have five docs in our practice. Remember, we have this rheumatology clinic. So we see a lot of lupus, the rheumatology, thyroid, all this fun stuff that's out there, autoimmune. Look at how this is missing here. Remember 2013, we told her that she had black L toxicity. She came back in 16. She even had more. Look at this again. Look at this hills. Would you rather sled ride down this hill and sled ride down this hill? See how this is nice and curvy? See, look how this is flattening out. So I'm having them maybe uh, when I draw this with like a, with like a marker, it's kind of neat to then take the picture away and then see how this is a lot flatter than this, this curve. So that's Plaquenil toxicity. My final polling question before landing this is, just real quick, did you gain any tips or gain confidence in your OC interpretation here tonight? And that just wanted to give me a time to see if there's any questions. Uh, thank you for a lecture. Okay, those are rolling in, not in the center phobia. Good, what is the VA? Perfect, so. Everyone, you're welcome. I'll end this poll and I'll just say thank you for attending uh, this OCT, OCT angiography and retinal disease. This was an interactive distance learning course. Um, I don't see any other questions. Um, and I just want to thank everyone for attending. This will end the CE.